Thank you very much for the kind invitation, Malena. Thank you for Thank you. Um, inviting us to talk about this very important topic to about in, in the auto-inflammatory disease. There is the involvement of the ear, nose, and throat in the auto-inflammatory disease because we are going to talk not just about uh, PIFAPA, but also some other disease in which we can find uh, some of these organs involved. And I think it's very interesting for, the, for everyone. Professor Tanya, do you want to say something? Oh, first of all, Melena, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here again. Uh, we did this uh, last year and it was uh, a great experience and uh, I'm at your disposal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, first of all, I would like to, just a second because it's not working. Okay, so I think uh, the, the first thing we have to think is about the concept about inflammatory disease because until 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, all the inflammatory phenotype or the inflammatory uh, phenomena that we could observe in the human, uh, we called it uh, autoimmune or autoimmunity disease because it was generated, the autoimmune uh, disease, this, it is a phenomenon that is generated by the T or B cell reactive T cells that generates an autoantibody to some tissue, some specific tissue, and it can and it lead to the formation of a systemic autoimmune disease or a localized autoimmune disease. But um, in the last uh, 20 years, during the last 20 years, uh, researchers have been observed that um, not all the inflammatory um, phenomena that we can see in the human are generated by, or the, there is not a presence of any autoantibody to any specific tissues. And uh, what revolutionized this concept is the presence of genetic mutations in some compartments of the innate immune cells. And this phenomena, this, uh, this two concept, I mean, the concept of autoimmunity or the concept that is in the inflammation is not generated by autoantibodies, it actually is generated by specific mutations in some compartments of the innate immune cells that generates some specific cytokines. Uh, it's uh, what have, that's what they have uh, revolutionized the, the, the concept of inflammation in the last 20 years when we can see two different um, concepts of autoimmune and out oh, on one side the autoimmune on the other side the autoinflammation um, concept and this also revolutionized the way we see disease because uh, based on the immunological concepts uh, of this uh, of the inflammation we changed the way we observe the disease why we changed it because um, as soon as this concept raised in, in, in 1999 when they discovered the the gene involved in the familial Mediterranean fever, many other disorders or many other clinical phenotypes that such as a pyodema gangrenosum, such as um, a bone, marrow, bone, bone involvement of, or, or osteomyelitis, or such as urticaria or recurrent fevers without unexplained recurrent fevers, many other um, diseases that we thought that is that was uh, autoimmune um, was uh, genetically, genetically dissected. We could find the gene involved in these disorders and we could create a group, a specific group of disease that we now call auto-inflammatory disease. So the auto-inflammatory disease is a group of disorders in which there is no um, auto-reactive T or B cells, there is no uh, auto-antibodies, and, we, and where we have specific genetic mutation, mutations in the innate immune compartment that generate some specific um, overexpression or over signaling of some specific cytokines. And of course, um, as we can imagine, uh, many in, in these, all these disorders, uh, all the organs in the human body have been found to be involved in auto-inflammatory disease. And also we have found some uh, disorders or some, um, uh, some inflammatory things related to the ear, nose and throat. And more specifically, um, that the, the PFAPA, that is, more, the, the, that is the most famous uh, auto-inflammatory disease in which we can see the ear, the nose, and the throat involved. But also, I would like to highlight here today uh, the, the, the news 
uh, in the involvement of these organs in anti-inflammatory disease. Because um, the PFAPA, that is the most com common or famous anti-inflammatory disease, is a specific disease related to the children. So we can find it only in children, may, uh, uh, rare manifestations in adulthood. But also uh, in 2020, another disease uh, that also uh, initially presents only within the involvement of the ear and of the nose also with polychondritis of the ear and the nose was found uh, just three years ago. That is the vaccine. So we now have auto-inflammatory disease that may involve the ear, the nose and the throat in children, but also in the elderly. So the PFAPA, what is the PFAPA? PFAPA is the most common, uh, is not a monogenic disease, is a multifactorial disease. And, uh, the, and the acronym of PFAPA means periodic fever, aftostomaritis, pharyngitis, and adenitis. It's, it, it, it also, the, the, the terms involved in the, in the acronyms of the disease also uh, defines the main clinical finding that we, can, that we find uh, in the PFAPA disease. Uh, I mean, the, the acronym is almost this, this, it's the same thing of the disease. So uh, it was really, uh, it's what it was found for the first time in 1948 by Raimann. Uh, he recognized that the specific group of children that came to the emergency department, they have uh, periodic visits to the emergency, emergency, emergency room. And he thought that this student was not infected by our streptococcus or any other infective agents. And he postulated for the first time that this must be not an infectious disease, but, also, but, but instead uh, an inflammatory disease. But it was just in 1987 that Marshall uh, could, uh, could a group of uh, some of these patients and that could really define a new syndrome that he, he named it, he labeled at that time to, of PFAPA. So PFAPA is a really new disease in the medical field. So, I mean, uh, it's, we don't have that much knowledge of the disorders. And just in 1999, when the concept of auto-inflammatory disease raised in the medical field, uh, PFAPA was put together with uh, all the others auto-inflammatory diseases. Why I'm telling you about this? Because we don't have that much experience. We don't know that much um, about the long-term follow-up of this disease. We don't have that much experience also yet of some chronic, um, a long life period um, manifestations of PFAPA. But we have a, we have a lot, we know a lot of how to differentiate and how to diagnose PFAPA. So that's why, um, I, I brought to you today a clinical case just to make everyone knows or understand how PFAPA uh, presents and how do we um, see or how we have to see uh, PFAPA. So PFAPA is a uh, periodic fever syndrome. So as we imagine, it, can, it comes periodically. So we have fevers that will come periodically in every month monthly periodic fever. So the patient usually starts in the first day with fever followed by adenopathy. So it's really common or it's easy to see uh, the presence of lymph nodes in the, in the cervical lymph nodes. We are usually, not all the time, they can have oral ulceration and not all the times also, but it's quite common to observe uh, pharyngitis. If you don't do anything, this will last for up to five to six days, and it will resolve spontaneously. After 20 to 30 days, it will start again with another episode of fever, sudden episode of fever, followed again by adenopathy, followed again by pharyngitis or not, or oral ulceration. The two first symptoms as a fever and adenopathy, it's, quite, it's the most common symptoms. Not all the times you will have pharyngitis, not all the times you will have oral ulceration. So this uh, is a typical uh, flare of PFAPA. So all PFAPA patients, they start uh, with the fever. It lasts for five, six, seven days, almost in the, the, the median ranges of five days. It will um, come again just after 20 day, 20 to 30 days. So this is the typical uh, clinical curse of PFAPA. And this is a typical um, 
uh, observation that all the families, all the fathers, all the mothers, all the, the physicians that works with anti-inflammatory disease ha may have received in the WhatsApp some any time because this is what the mothers usually see and that's what they send to us. Is this mouth when you can see the, uh, the, the, the tonsils here with some small spot uh, white spots there that it, it resembles the infection. So it really seems like infection. But as I told you, if it, it will last for from five to seven days and it will resolve, resolve spontaneously. So uh, uh, what is really common and it's normal that for the first time it happens to a child, uh, all the parents will take the children to the emergency department or the ped pediatrician to, to see if it's really an infection. So during the symptomatic period of BIFAPA, what you can find in the laboratory analysis, because it's uh, it's common that uh, when you take the student to the emergency room or to the pediatrician, they will request some um, laboratory to check if it's really infections or to check if it's really, um, it's not any other disease. So it's quite, it's common to observe high levels of CRP, uh, um, inflammatory marker. It's common to observe high levels of SAAs, serum amyloid uh, substance. It's normal to observe uh, high levels or um, of leukocyte level. So it really looks like an infection. Sometimes you can have neutrophilia, uh, high, high, high levels of neutrophils too. And what is most important is to check that uh, during the first, second, third time, at least one time, to check if there is that there is no um, strepto infection of the of the tonsil. So it, this is sometimes what I used to say to my patients is that it's mandatory at least once in during one flare when you are investigating a patient that with a possible PFAPA that you need to have at least this. Uh, lab analysis done. You have to check that's really inflammatory, so high levels of CRP and SAA. You have to check that you don't have here a uh, low count of neutrophils and not instead of high levels of neutrophil. And you have to check that it's really not an infectious uh, amygdalitis, which, which is the most common. So uh, as soon as this was done, of course, some, pa some parents or some pediatrician. So you can try to give the, the children a single shot of steroids and it will abort the flare. But after um, 30 days, it will start again. And if you go to the emergency department again, if you do again this laboratory analysis, we will find again the same or the same pattern of laboratory that you had um, in the last episode. And it's, what is really important too, it's because it's, it's very important to observe that between these uh, episodes, you have a normalization of the levels of on CRP or SAA. Why? Because uh, PFAPA, it's theoretically a disease in which you don't have inflammation between the, the episodes. So this is a typical clinical and laboratory phenotypes of PFAPA. So this is what I have to tell. So, and how do I do the diagnosis of a PFAPA in a children? Uh, to, to make clear or to make it more easily to be done, uh, Marshall proposed the first diagnosed criteria to the PFAPA, which have been uh, revisited during, during these years because of course everyone knows um, it was not the perfect um, the perfect way to, 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 to do the, the, criteria, the, the criteria diagnosis. But so many other groups have been working on different diagnosis criteria over the years, but we still don't have a consensus on the diagnosis of, of FIFA. So we still use the Marshall criteria. So the first thing uh, in that Marshall proposed and that we still uh, use in our daily practice is that, is that children with suspected PFAPA must have uh, regular episodes of fever. And it must start uh, before the first years of age. Why? Because many other monogenic fev uh, fevers, uh, periodic fevers, it starts after the first years of age. And here I also would like to tell some experience that we have, that we are, have been working on the Brazilian criteria for PFAPA2 is that we don't, we not, uh, it's not common 
to observe uh, the, 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 the flares of PFAPA to start before the first year of life. So I would say uh, regular episodes of fever that starts after the first year of life and before the first year of life. So this is the first, and that's why it has to be really clear to all physicians and all patients or families that here that's you know, observing us. Second um, diagnostic criteria is that all the symptoms that I have told before must, must occur or must be observed in the absence of, an, of, of a respiratory infection. So that's why it's very important at least once to be sure that you don't have um, an infection with a streptotest test that must be, can be realized in the merge department or in any laboratory. So that's the first thing. The, when you are, when, after you are sure that all these um, symptoms are not um, followed by infection, uh, you have to, you need to have at least two of these three symptoms. That is aftosis stomatitis, that is the oral ulceration that you can observe usually in, uh, in the both sides of the, I forgot the name of gengiva in English. Uh, so you have the dour ulceration usually comes in some atypical uh, localizations. The, after Professor Tanya can comment more on this. Uh, the cervical lymph node, so it's usually really clear. The families use it, the mothers and the fathers usually, they, they can see uh, the, the lymph node that is palpable in the cervical uh, area here. And also the pharyngitis that you can observe as a, uh, as, I, as I showed you in that picture, but sometimes you cannot observe that clear, that, that white points with that simulates infection. Sometimes you just see some redness there or the, the children just say that it's hurting there. But uh, at least two of these symptoms must be present, must be present during the episodes of fever. That's the, the, third, the third criteria uh, I put a mark on here because that's very important. Because as we are talking more about PFAPA now, all the children that goes often to the emergency department, the physicians, the, the pediatricians are calling them PFAPA. But it's quite, it's, it's, it's very important to at least once to have the laboratory demogram, the, 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 to have the neutrophil count there in, in the, during the fever. Because uh, a, very, a very important differential diagnosis to the children that comes with recurrent fever and infection that simulates infections, it's cyclic neutropenia. So it's very important. That's why it's very important to all the families understand that you can, you must have at least one neutrophilic um, analysis done during one fever. So the fourth uh, criteria, which is very important too, is that the children must have, must be asymptomatic between the episodes. Why? Because also some other monogenic disease, that, that's, that's why everyone is worried or that we talk that much about the genetic sequencing patients with atypical PFAPA because usually the uh, monogenic disorders or other disease that may mimic uh, uh, PFAPA, they, the children is not completely asymptomatic between the episodes. So it's something really important also to observe. And now, of course, the children must have a normal growth and development because, um, of course, some other severe disease they impede the, the children to grow and to develop. So it's very important to be strict to to, to pay attention to the to the criteria diagnosed, proposed a bar marshal, bar marshal, or any other criteria that you must follow to don't uh, miss any diagnosis of PFAPA and to be sure that the, the diagnosis of PFAPA was done correctly. Um, here in Brazil, I usually tell the residents or, or what I do in my daily practice is that I always that I observe these episodes for at least three to six months to be sure that we should, that we can observe the same pattern of fever or the symptoms during, during these episodes. And I also, um, would like to highlight here because when a uh, periodic fever in a children with uh, around the first year of life is not the same periodic fever in the children of uh, from the age to four to five. Why? Because uh, during the first year of life, uh, the children usually don't don't talk. They, she cannot express what she's feeling, so it's quite difficult to uh, to understand what's happening. And we we're gonna have just the uh, ob objective 
um, observation in this in these children. So that's why it's com it's more the, the diagnosis relies more on this um, on the symptoms that I'm telling to, talking to you. That is fever, adenopathy, pharyngitis, and oral observation because you observe it's objective. But as soon as these children grows up, uh, she will start to uh, to have more symptoms that sometimes is also acceptable in patients with PFAP. Why? Because uh, uh, before the first episode of fever, usually around the three or four years when she starts to talk, they almost 100% of the time, I would say that, they also they always say, I, can, I have mild abdominal pain. So usually they, they complain of abdominal pain that is not severe. I mean, what is not severe? Uh, the children doesn't stop to eat. The children doesn't have that severe abdominal pain that she has to go to the bed. So it's usually a mild abdominal pain. It's also quite common to the children say, I have a leg pain. Usually it hurts. Um, in the region of the elbow here. And usually the children uses used to say that she has a uh, headache. So these are acceptable symptoms that may be additional uh, to the classical symptoms of PIFA. But some other uh, symptoms that may appear or that are maybe present or may, may, may come together with all these other symptoms that some, some other are not acceptable. And this, uh, which is more, what's more common to observing patients with periodic fever that is not acceptable is a skin rash or manifestations of the skin, especially urticaria or some skin macular, for example. Some alterations in the gastrointestinal, so such as severe and disabling abdominal pain. So that children have that, that, that febrile episodes in which the children say that is very severe, you have to go to the emergency department or you have to take her to the pediatrician because of the, the abdominal pain. So it's not acceptable. It doesn't, doesn't um, fulfill the criteria of PFAPA. Uh, if this fever comes with diarrhea or if the children also has diarrhea out of the fever, or if the fever comes with constipation, which this is not acceptable because it, as I told you, it's not reported to be um, a, a, a phenotype of the of the FIFAPA. Uh, other muscular skeletal, skeletal syndromes also is not um, are not acceptable, such as uh, joint pain, so the child cannot walk. So if a children with a, a fever, uh, or, or ulceration, pharyngitis, and now oral ulcer has a, a joint pain that she cannot walk. So this is not a PFAPA, this is something else. And why I'm talking about this not acceptable symptoms in patients with periodic fever? Because um, uh, we, we can segregate uh, uh, monogenics from polygenics or multifactorial disorders. Uh, in the periodic fever syndrome. And these signs that are not acceptable are signs that indicate that this patient must be sequenced because it can be a monogenic disease. So every time that you find a patient with a periodic fever and that you find this, that you have this uh, not acceptable symptoms together, this is a moment you have to think like, I need the genetic sequence to be done here. So which the genetic sequence? You can go, through a wall genome sequencing, you can go through wall exome sequencing, you have a panel, but you have at least, you need to have at least one genetic sequence done here because this uh, a monogenic disease such as familial Mediterranean fever, cryopreneal associated periodic fever, fever uh, syndrome, hyper IgG, IgD, or any other monogenic periodic fever must be ruled out in this patient. And also, and also, no, and also because you have to treat, you have to treat all, of course, the children with a PFAPA and also the children with a not PFAPA, let's say like this, the ones with a not accepted. So the PFAPA treatment, it's also something um, very objective. So we have, we have a strict uh, flow chart to treat patients with PFAPA, but of course it has to be done and I will have to discuss this with the family to show them the options and to, work to make them um, choose the best treatment choice for the children with PIFA. So the first thing is to treat, the, because we have to think that these children must have the treatment done in the flare and not in the flare. So first, let's talk about the flare. So I, I, I suggest to everyone at least once to be sure 
that this flare is not an infectious flare or before giving them the steroids. Because especially now or uh, some, now, not now, no, but, but now also now, uh, we had a change in the virus uh, periods here in Brazil, for example, and we, I'm seeing a lot of patients uh, a lot, of, a lot of PFAPA patients flaring, uh, not because of just the PFAPA, but because they are infected with adenovirus or rhinovirus and other virus. So sometimes to be sure that this is just an inflammation and not an infection. Of course, in the first flare, uh, or at least one flare during the, the, the period of the diagnosis, it's mandatory to have at least a streptotest realized to be sure that this is not an infectious. So, uh, when you are sure that this patient has really an infection, so uh, you can give them a, a single shot of steroids, one to two milligrams per kilogram of steroids, that the flare, then the, the, this shot will uh, stop or abort the flare. But do we need to routinely rule out infections all the flares of these patients? No. We don't have to go to the merge department. We don't have to go to the pediatrician. We don't have to be extremely anxious or, or nervous because of, oh my God, if this is an infection. It's because the single shot of steroids is not a problem for any, a, a virus infection or it's not a problem or it, and it will resolve the inflammation flare. Because uh, we, when you are sure about the diagnosis, when we are clear about the diagnosis, uh, it's not a problem to give them a single shot of steroid in the first, uh, in the first, uh, the, the, as soon as you have the fever, give them the first uh, shot of steroids. Why? That's my opinion. And I think it's more um, healthy because instead of letting the child to suffer for a, a three to four to five days of recurrent fever, just giving them um, uh, and say it's, it's more, I think it's better, of course, to give them a single shot of steroid to abort the flare. So, but this is also a point to consider and to discuss with the parents because some parents don't, doesn't want to give uh, steroids to the child. They prefer to give them um, non-steroids uh, and say such as ibuprofen or tachypidina in Italia or something like this. But of course there's pros and cons and I have my opinion as I told you, because what I do in my daily practice is when I tell my parents to, when they see the child with the first uh, fever at 37.8 degrees, give them the first shot of, 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 of steroids because it will um, cut the, the flare. But some, some parents doesn't want uh, because the, the use of steroids during the flares may shortens the, in this, the, the intervals between the flares. This is something that really can happen, but it doesn't happen to all the patients, but it really can happen and it's common. It's not abnormal. It's, not, um, it's, not, it's something that we can uh, expect to occur after the use of steroids. But, and this is something that doesn't occur when you use just abscates because it doesn't short the flares between um, the, the febrile fat flares. But uh, here in Brazil, we observe a lot of allergic reactions because of the uh, chronically use the chronic use of NSAIDs. So these are the pros and cons of using steroids versus NSAIDs uh, in the flares. And of course, this must be discussed with the parents to take their opinion, let them think of what's the best they think to they think they can do to the child. Um, and of course, uh, PIFAPA just will. Um, uh, resolve by the age of five years. So from one to five years, you still have time to do a lot of things. So what do we do? The chronic treatment, if I here, or maybe uh, let's say um, the review that we did in the literature, um, the chronic treatment um, is if a child just need one shot of steroid a month, we keep it like that. Uh, I mean, if it's uh, if the child is uh, younger than five years, maybe it's quite difficult to have a surgery be done to remove the tonsils here. But so if we keep it like that, it doesn't. It's not a problem in less than one shot of steroid. Amount. But if the child needs or requires more than one shot of steroid in a month, I mean more than one shot, two days or two consecutive days or two days in a month, this is too much. So we need to have to talk about something else 
to, to don't use that much steroids. Um, and this is something very important. That's why we have also Professor Tanya Kishi has a, a large experience because it, um, the, the surgical removal of the tonsils of the, of the amygdala and of the adenoids is also is a curative treatment of PFAPA. And in both of the scenarios, for an example, if the children are using too much steroids or if the children here has any mechanical obstruction of the nose, like snores at night, or if this has a lot of uh, recurrent sinusitis, that is also something important in the, in, in the clinical evaluation, we need uh, um, our otorhinolaryngologist evaluation to see if there's an indication for surgical removal of the tonsils or of the adenoids. And because um, almost all PFAPA patients, I would say almost all 90 or more percent of them, after the removal, we will not have five fever again. If um, the child uh, still have flare, flares, or fever. After the surgery, we have to think about any other prophylaxis. This is the proposed uh, guideline or flowchart to treatment of PFAPA of many groups. But of course, this is uh, this all these steps can be discussed at any time with the family because sometimes some families doesn't want to have the surgical removal of the tonsils, so we go directly to the use of prophylaxis. And here. I have a great experience using uh, colpicine. Uh, not all the physicians have the same experience I have. Some others have you have been using uh, cementidine. That it's uh, I don't have that much experience, and also because we don't have that uh, we don't have that easy access to cementidine here in Brazil. And some other uh, magical treatments are also. <laughs> Um, growing up in the literature, but I don't have that great experience with these ones until today. So, but of course, this chronic treatment must be discussed with the family. Here in Brazil, we have a great experience of, with all the patients with a very frequent fever that requires more than one steroids a month that doesn't want to go to surgery. We put them on colchicin, a very low dose. It's not toxic. It's not... Um, it's effective in controlling both the fever and both also some other mild symptoms that also can come together with the PFAPA. So this is the, uh, the PFAPA um, treatment plan that we have been postulating in the last years here in Brazil. And also the, uh, uh, every time that we have, uh, we are, uh, well, we are um, talking about recurrent fever that we're talking more probably about a PFAPA, and when we have or don't, we don't have uh, these not acceptable symptoms, or if this child has been tonsillectomized or not tonsillectomized, and if it doesn't fulfill any clinical diagnosis, we go to the DNH sequencing and we don't find any causative gene involved in the monogenic disease, we have to think about SERF, systemic undefined recurrent fever. That is a known group of disease that are children that, that just present with recurrent fever or sometimes with some mild episodes of inf inflammation in any other tissue and it, that we don't have causative gene. And why it's very important? Because uh, for SERFs, we also have a different treat therapeutic plan for them. And we also have a different uh, therapy uh, plan for the diagnosis. I have a very interesting case from our center here in Brazil that was has the, in 20 years, not 20, 15 years ago, he was diagnosed uh, with recurrent fever. At that time, we didn't have um, uh, many odd, I mean, we, we were not, not that modern in genetic sequencing. So they did uh, a Sanger sequence and, and they called it a uh, familial Mediterranean fever. They put the child on colchicine, it didn't work. Then they changed the treatment and then they come, they came, the children came to our department. We did a target panel and it was negative. It means the, the previous diagnosis of FMF was not FMF. We put that child, child on, on TNF because we thought it was um, uh, an inflammatory bowel disease. It didn't work. Then we put the child on anti-IL-1. Then we did an exome sequence, and that's why I'm talking about this odyssey of genetic sequence for the diagnosis of recurrent fever. And it was also negative. 
So uh, at that time, uh, the concept of a uh, surf came out in the literature and we called her, call her the child of surf. But uh, we put her, the, him, on the use of cana quinoa because we don't have a natura here in Brazil and it could control the disease for two years. Then the genome sequence came to our uh, reality and we did the genomic sequencing and we found a homozygous mutation in REPK1 gene. And as, as soon as we got the diagnosis, he also had some severe bleeding, in the intentional bleeding. He came to the emergency room. He was hospitalized for more than six months with us. And the ability, or I mean, the, 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 the genetic sequencing that we found uh, could made us change the treatment from anti-L1 to another to JAK inhibitors. And that's why I tell you, it's very important to recognize SERFs patients because when you recognize this group of disease, you don't stop searching, you go moving on, you, you continue to move on to the genetic diagnosis. And also we have plans to treat these patients. It's very important to recognize some patients with SERF. So pay attention on this. And also it's very interesting also because the auto-inflammatory disease is not, uh, there are not, it's not disorders of the children. We have many, um, we have not many, we have a very specific group of auto-inflammatory disease that have been discovered just three years ago that is a specific disease of the elderly and it calls VEX syndrome. And it's very interesting because that's why I told Malena that the topic of the lecture today is very interesting because it manifests as a relaxing polychondritis, that is the thickening and also the redness of the ear or the nose. So you have you can clearly see that is in inflammation in the ear or in the nose. And it has been reported uh, for the first time in 2020, so it's extremely new. And it is another way to observe the ear, nose, and throat manifestations in all inflammatory disease. So this is called vexus because it means vacuums. E1 ubiquitina activating enzyme, X linked, it means just observed in men or just observed in men because uh, some groups have been imparted some, um, in some numbers of patients in women too. It's an auto inflammatory disease and it's not a germline mutation, it's a somatic mutation. And uh, here is the, the, the clinical phenotypes reported in the first group that was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was just observed in male in the age of 64 years old, for range from 45 to 80. It all the patients present with a genetic mutation, somatic mutation in the UB1 gene. So in, in the beginning, almost all the mutations were in this position, 41, but now we have many others. And chondritis and ear involvement is the most common manifestation of the, I mean, one of the most common manifestations of the, the disease. So fever followed with ear and chondritis in the elderly. Think of vexus. And all these, uh, all the patients were inflamed, so they have high levels of CRP and ESR. And uh, it's very interesting because relapsing polychondritis came as the criteria diagnosed proposed by the group of that times because it's really common to observe. So how do we diagnose uh, vexus? Uh, nowadays, vexus uh, has many uh, clinical phenotypes observed. It has been also related to lupus and other disease. So you can see vexus everywhere in the elderly. But which is very interesting is that polychondritis is it's a common, it's a constant finding to almost all the diseases observed. And the diagnosis you can the, during or for the diagnosis you will, can observe these vacuums here in the bone marrow aspiration. So it's uh, typical. And definitely the, defi the definitive diagnosis of PIPAPA, oh, PIPAPA, sorry, of vexus, you uh, will observe these uh, somatic mutations or in the bone marrow or in specific group of cells. For example, neutrophils, you hear that you cannot see in the, the, the T cells, but you have a somatic mutation on the OBA1 gene in the periphery. And uh, treatment of excess syndrome is, which is very interesting because uh, some classical um, drugs used to, to treat uh, autoimmune disease or any other inflammatory disease also has an effect on the treatment of excess. But uh, what is very interesting is because almost all patients uh, have a good response to IL-6 
and some patients, some selected patients may benefit of uh, bone marrow transplantation. So it's very interesting to see also the ear, nose, and throat involvement in the elderly of this um, autoclamatory disease. And it's what is very interesting too, is because Bexas, it's not supposed to be a, a very rare disease as all the other autoclamatory. It's supposed to occur in one to 4,000 patients. So it's quite common in the, in the world. And I would like to finish here and to thank uh, all the group that supports me to have the knowledge and to have the time to be here today to talk to everyone. Uh, Dr. Mirtis, Dr. Luis, Samar, Alex, and Jacqueline that work together in our laboratory. Professor Tanya that's always support all my, all my plans and all my ideas. Professor George Calil, this is us last week in, in Professor Calil's um, uh, at the Academy, National Academy of Medicine, and also the group that look to autoinflammatory disease in the laboratory, Professor Alessandra, Professor Samar, and Professor Malu that helped us with our uh, laboratories in autoinflammatory disease. So, and also this is my mail. So, if you want, if you, if, if anyone wants, uh, would like to talk about anything, this is my email. And I would like to invite everyone for our meeting, Brazilian meeting in auto-inflammatory disease that uh, take place here in Sao Paulo. We have also the online um, um, mode of presentation, so we can watch it online. Uh, it, it occurs in, it helps, it occurs in uh, October, uh, 28 and 29th of October. So everyone is invited to, um, to our meeting. Thank you very much. And I, I, I don't know what time it is. Um, it's uh, quarter to, um, for your quarter to five, I suppose. <laughs> so we still have uh, 15, 15 minutes, minutes to, yes. to, to, to make some comments. Uh, I would like, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, you gave a fantastic lecture, uh, overview, Leonardo about uh, the anti-inflammatory disease and really the familiar uh, fever, Mediterranean fever was a kickball uh, to all the inflammatory disease and uh, started uh, from that. Uh, it's not easy. If, if, if you have a child that goes with tonsillitis to an emergency room and uh, a pediatrician or uh, a general practitioner sees the child and he has, a child has purulent secretion and has a high fever and abdominal pain, sometimes joint uh, 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 aches, uh, a pain, um, and they take uh, the, 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 the quick uh, A strep uh, swab and it will be positive for a strep A. This is very common because a strep A uh, uh, tonsillitis gives all this uh, clinical picture as well as, um, as also as Leonardo mentioned, uh, the, the, the papa uh, sometimes could come with abdominal pain, sometimes with uh, some um, a joint uh, uh, complaint uh, as well, uh, but uh, it's completely different. And the, the laboratory test, especially the swab one for the quick strep A is always negative. So for me, it's very important for that reason that um, it's important to do a swab. Of course, when you go to, to the emergency room, first boat uh, of fever, second uh, uh, attack, third attack, sometimes it's not easy to, to, to put the, the child in a FAPA syndrome uh, 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 kind of. Uh, but then uh, with the periodic periodicity and with all those, 80% uh, uh, of the child with the FAPA, they have tonsillitis. They have pharyngotonsillitis. 70% uh, uh, they have cerv cervical adenitis. And only 70% they have in this vestibular area here in the lip and the gums, they have uh, the, the after syndrome. After is not so common as the pharyngitis or tonsillitis and cervical adenitis. So it, it's not easy. I, I'm quite aware, even good uh, uh, pediatricians and good uh, general practitioners in the OR they will uh, uh, miss the diagnosis, especially when there will be the first uh, flares, let me say like this. We have very good experience with um, 
uh, uh, corticoid in, in those children. But the problem is that when you started to short the corticoid interval, nobody is happy with this. So usually when this is a problem and the child didn't respond, for instance, to the prophylactic treatment with colchicine that uh, uh, Leonardo used a lot, uh, they all say, Tanya, what should you do right now? So I think that uh, surgery could be considered, of course, should be individualized in each case. And um, if there is a, a, a limitation in the clinical aspect of, in terms of pharmacological uh, options, I think that uh, surgery, it's interesting. If you don't go well in plan B, you have plan B. You, at plan A, you have plan B. So I think that's very, very important. And um, we had uh, quite, uh, quite a good number of patients that we did the tonsillectomy or adenotonsillectomy, uh, um, independent of uh, snor snoring or uh, uh, sleep apnea that we do in those, those cases. But in specific um, going uh, straight to, to FAPA syndrome, we had very good response. Some cases uh, continues to have, but they have other uh, uh, eventuality, other, other uh, problems besides uh, this. And I think that uh, depend on which continent that you live. For instance, in the United States, a FAPA child, if a plan A that's clinical, pharmacological, doesn't resolve, they go to surgery. In Europe, it's not so easy. It, they seldom do surgery. They don't indicate, they don't promote surgery uh, as in the United States. So you are treated in one way, in one uh, continent, and sometimes in other ways. But I think that you should have your mind open, open to plan E and plan B, and consider the plan B, that's the surgical one, when you have uh, are important, when you don't have uh, uh, solution when do you don't have results to the plan A. Okay. I think that we have some uh, questions uh, from the uh, audience that uh, Leonardo would like please to answer, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor. And uh, for everyone that is watching us, if you need uh, indication for otorhinolaryngologists all over the world, Professor Tanya, she knows at least one in, in each country in the world. So if you want to need some, someone, just, just text her because she, she will know someone there. And I, yes, we have some questions. I still have time to for some actions. I cannot uh, give some medical consultations during this mass text, but uh, for an example, uh, one dose of steroids per flare, more than 12 times are used, that's correct. Uh, will not be produced prejudicial to the child. Yes, if the child takes more takes one more than one shot of steroids in a month, or I do here in Brazil for an example or something like this during the next three months. How many shots? How many? How many? Of, um, uh, how many times you took steroids the next three months? It was more than three, so so, so it's too much. So we have to discuss. Uh, treatments options to don't use that much steroids. The first thing, as Professor said, uh, I think that it's a good it's good it's a good moment to have an opinion of uh, of, of uh, PRNT specialists because maybe uh, there are also other indications for remo surgical removal of the tonsil. So this is the first thing that I would suggest. The second. If the child, the family doesn't want any surgical treatment, and there is nothing, there, there is no indication for this, the treatment, or if you cannot do the treat, the, the surgical removal that time, think of other uh, possible treatment. This is the, this, that's what we do here in Brazil. If children are outside the range range of one to five years, does that rule them of, of PFAPA? This is complex because if the fever started after the age of five, yes. So the FAPA doesn't start after the age of five. If the fever started before the age of five or, or in the interval of one to five years, it might be a PFAPA that is, are, that is still going to have flares for some years, then it's going to end. So this is, the, this is the answer. Is there a minimum consistent fever during a flare required for a FAPA diagnosis? Fever. The definition of fever is 37.8 37. fevers. 
Um, below that, it's not fever. So it's what which is important. What is important is to have fever that on that pe in that period. So uh, be, uh, if it's 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, I don't know, it's fever too. So high um, fever and low fever, it's always fever uh, of the fever. Leo, sorry to interrupt. 37.8 Celsius, that's 100.4 Fahrenheit for- uh, yeah, Thank you very much for yeah. the tra translation. Yeah. Uh, this is something I, I would like to answer this question because what about generalized lymphadenopathy? So uh, it's not common and it's not typical to have generalized lymphadenopathy during the flares. Uh, sometimes it can happen if it can, it can happens if the child has a uh, virus infection, for example, COVID can have these or any other virus can can uh, have can have no can uh, present as with generalized lymphadenopathy. But if, if it's a consistent uh, pattern of uh, of the clinical phenotype, this is not common in PFAPA. I would suggest to go to look after any other diagnosis. Uh, the doses that the drug the, the, the drug we use as prophylaxis here in Brazil, what we must use is colchicine. Uh, everyone knows colchicine. Uh, we use, uh, for example, in that range, uh, below the age of four, we use uh, 0 0.5 milligrams. Uh, from four to six, we use uh, 0 0.5 to one milligram, depends on the tolerance or the exception of the children. And after the age of 12, we put them on 1.5 milligrams a day of prophylaxis. Of course, it's not for all PFAPA. Uh, is PFAPA completely ruled out uh, if tonsil and adenoid removals is unsuccessful? Mm, I would say no, because uh, sometimes what we observe is that uh, some children, or maybe uh, the toddler, for example, they still have flat fevers for three, four, five months after the surgery. Not that, that high fever, symptomatics, they can have some mild fever. So I would observe that. But if it's it, it, if the children still have fat fevers after the surgical removal, I would suggest another consultation to check if there is, if it's really a FAPA. What else? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, how about uh, the steroids? Which kind of steroids? Hydrocortisone? Uh, do you have any experience, uh, Leonardo? Because we use well, prednisone uh, here. Uh, how about in hydrocortisone? Europe, in, Euro, in Europe, you have they have the beta metazone that it's uh, it's really more effective to treat the, to treat the flares. But we don't have the bethmetazone here in Brazil, so we give the child here in Brazil, the children, our children, a prednisone. Here in Brazil, we use prednisone, but it, we use this, the equivalent dose of bethmetazone in Europe. In Europe, some pediatricians I have saw that they prefer to give the child uh, bethmetazone because they have it more. Um, uh, it's it's easy to find them. I don't know why it's, what, what why the difference they use betamazon there instead of prednisone, but you can use both of them. That's not a problem. How um, about probiotic? Probiotic. Yeah, this is something very interesting. <laughs> that uh, I really think it's interesting. No, really. I, I I I posted a video on the internet, on my Instagram account some days ago because I really think uh, that um, something uh, occurs in the in the in the. Um, or on the microbiota of the mouth of the child during the fevers. I really think it's really interesting, but uh, we still don't have any conclusive studies and we also don't have anything that is very uh, consistent to support the use of any probiotics. And it's something very interesting too, is because I think, in my opinion, if we could give them some probiotics, probiotics, we could give them something to wash the mouth. That's, I think that's the perfect way to treat because it's something that changes just in the mouth. We don't observe any other uh, uh, symptom. And what we give, or not we give, but what people are giving today is oral, oral or so they take uh, of probiotics, and I think it doesn't work. I mean, uh, I, I've seen some children that have been uh, visiting uh, some physicians in Europe that have been prescribing uh, probiotics, and it's not working at all. I mean, uh, what I would expect 
uh, if the probiotics would work, if it is that the children doesn't have any fever again. So this for me would be a treatment that worked. But what we see in these children that are taking probiotics is that they, they have like, instead of three or instead of five, four days of fever. Instead of 41, they are having 40 degrees of fever. I mean, it's not consistent. It's, I don't think it's consistent uh, to give, to, to support the opinion, okay, let's give probiotics to everyone. I think, I mean, it's, it, it may be an answer, but this is not the solution. That's my opinion. The no professor Sanya. No, I, I don't use probiotics, but I know that, for instance, in uh, Canada, in the French Canada, there are some uh, physicians that are using probiotics for a chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, they use in drops in uh, installation, nasal installation, and they say that uh, it's uh, worthwhile. But I don't have any experience at all. And I, I, I'm a person that uh, only believe when I, uh, when I see, you know, and uh, until now, I don't have any experience at all. Okay, thank you very much. I think, can vitamin D reduce episodes? Wow, this is another controversial question. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, there are many, um, uh, here in Brazil, we have a name for this, I'd say Macumba. <laughs> you can give any kind of treatment to children with PFAPA, but uh, as a professor Tanya said, I mean, I just believe when it really works. If it doesn't work, I mean, it's work uh, more or less. I, I don't believe this in this almost all these treatments. Uh, you can find everything in the literature. You can you can find review of everything. You can find the publications of many things. But in the daily practice, it, none of these treatments works um, to, to really abort the, the fever. I'm sorry, but I cannot uh, reply any other questions. Uh, it's, it's 5 p.m. here in Brazil and I have, um, I really have to go because I have to see an, a patient that is hospitalized. Thank you so much, uh, Leonardo, and thank you so much, uh, Melena. Thanks well, so thank much for you your so audience. much to both of you. Um, it was a great presentation, like always. And we hope to see you or to have you again um, very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Malena.